I would request Dr. Parit Dalvi to deliver the first lecture. All that you wanted to know about PFO and were afraid to ask. Uh, respected chairpersons and my dear friends, I've been asked to speak on PFO, a critical overview of the data. It's not a very exciting topic because there will be a lot of data, a lot of numbers. But we'll try and see how interesting we can make it and try and see whether we can carry home some messages. In the interest of time, I'm going to restrict myself to PFO and cryptogenic strokes and not really touch upon migraine, decompression sickness, or systemic embolization. You will agree with me that in the field of structural heart disease, this is one of the most hotly debated topics. And why so much of debate? I think the answer is simple. It is because of extreme polarization of opinions, not only amongst the physicians, but also amongst patients. I would divide the groups into two. There are enthusiasts who believe that you must close every hole. They say, just do it. And then there are skeptics who say, just dump it. There is no reason for PFO to be closed with a device and that you can do as well with medicines. Probably the truth lies somewhere in between. Now, what is the argument of enthusiasts? They believe that PFOs are the cause, not merely an association, in over 50% of cryptogenic strokes in the young, less than 55 years of age. They also believe that if the magnitude of the stroke is severe, either in the form of dense hemiplegia with or without aphasia, it can be quite devastating, not only to the patient, but also to the families. They extend their argument by saying PFOs are easy to close and that transcatheter closure of PFOs is quite safe and effective. Then why not close all PFOs in patients above the age of 15 years, whether secondarily or even primarily? Now, what do the skeptics believe? They feel that PFO is injudiciously implicated in the causation of cryptogenic strokes. I think the data is not sufficient. And they feel that it is at its best a mere association rather than cause and effect. In most of the cases, it's an innocent bystander. And when it comes to closure, they ask you, show us the evidence. There is no evidence to show that Device closure can prevent recurrence of cryptogenic stroke, leave alone for primary prevention. They point fingers at the market forces. They say that device closure goes on because the market forces are rather too powerful. And if you know the market uh, share for device closure is to the tune of two billion US dollars per year. And no matter how safe or effective, they believe that this procedure does have finite complication rate. So why do it? What I'm going to do in next 10 to 12 minutes is just to take you through two issues. The first, what is the relationship between PFO and cryptogenic strokes? Is it cause and effect or mere association? And if it is mere association, what is the strength of this association? And the second question that I would try and answer, should we be closing PFOs at all in those with cryptogenic strokes, mainly in the light of closure one results? Let's talk of cause and effect. You know, when you talk of mycobacterium tuberculosis or salmonella typhi causing typhoid fever, it's very simple to prove cause and effect relationship. You just have to show that it fulfills Cox postulates and there you have cause and effect relationship. But when you are talking about epidemiological studies like smoking causing bronchogenic carcinoma, dyslipidemias causing coronary artery disease, I think it's a different ballgame altogether and cause and effect relationship is not so easy to prove. What epidemiologists have done in order to prove this relationship, they have looked at five issues. One is the consistency of association. Second is the strength of association as expressed by relative risks. Is there a pathophysiological basis which can, effect, which can explain cause and effect? Does it fit into temporality of events? And last but not the least, is there a dose-response relationship? Now let's look at the consistency of association and strength of association between PFO and cryptogenic strokes. 
Till 1970, only eight cases of PFOs were reported having paradoxical embolism, only three with cryptogenic strokes. It was in late 80s that two articles were published, one in Lancet and the other in New England Journal, which showed that PFO is twice as common. So if the incidence is 25% in general population, both these studies showed that the incidence here was more than 50% when it came to cryptogenic strokes in young. And then came the meta-analysis, which was published in 2000 in Neurology, which showed that the odds ratio was to the tune of five when you looked at PFO alone, and it jumped to 23 when you looked at PFO with atrial septal aneurysm while uh, comparing them with those having cryptogenic strokes at an age less than 55 years. It's not only true in younger population, but when they looked at data in patients above the age of 55 years having cryptogenic strokes and those having stroke with routine risk factors, the odds ratio for PFO alone was to the tune of three, whereas it jumped to four when PFO was added on to atrial septal aneurysm. So irrespective of the age, PFO continues to be at the center of this drama of cryptogenic strokes. What about pathophysiology and temporal sequence? If you look at the SPARC study, you will find that PFO is the only source of embolism in those with atrial septal aneurysms having cryptogenic strokes. So if you took away PFO, atrial septal aneurysm did not cause any incremental risk in this subset of patients. Only if they had PFO that the risk was many folds higher. Look at another data on economy class stroke syndrome. When you travel in economy class, longer flights, you tend to sit at a place, many of, you, many of us develop deep vein thrombosis. And what happens is when you get down at the point of destination, many of them develop ischemic strokes. These are not the patients who have routine risk factors. And if you look at the incidence of patent foramen ovale in this subset, it is significantly higher as compared to general population. The same is true when you look at the data of pulmonary thromboembolism. PFO is a most important determinant of outcome. And why? Because of the presence of PFO, the same thrombi which cause pulmonary thromboembolism can go across and cause strokes. That's why incidence of strokes is higher and can cause even death because of coronary artery embolism. So all these things are again pointers that PFO could be the villain in this drama of PFO and cryptogenic strokes. What about dose response relationship? I think there are a number of papers to suggest that size of PFO definitely increases the risk of CVA. So also the magnitude of the shunt, larger the magnitude, more is the risk. If you have presence of right to left shunt at rest, of course the risk is more as compared to those who have only right to left shunt on provocation. And lastly, if you have closed a PFO with a device and if you have a residual shunt on contrast study, the chances of you getting recurrence is more as compared to those who have complete elimination of shunt. Now what do the skeptics believe? They think that this is not good enough evidence and what would be the most credible evidence? The best way to prove this hypothesis will be to study them prospectively and look at the relationship, those having PFO and not having PFO, what happens to them in terms of incidence of stroke. And two, or three elegantly conducted studies, one appeared in Mayo Clinic and two in Jack. They showed that there was no difference in incidence of ischemic strokes with or without PFO at the end of five to six years. The objections raised by the enthusiasts are that these studies were not adequately powered to study a small difference and that's why they were negative and that five to six years follow-up is not good enough. You require much more follow-up. Now we come to the second point of our talk. Does PFO closure reduce recurrence? There is a large data from multiple studies which are non-randomized, non-blinded for assessment of endpoints, having variability in patient population and variable antiplatelet and anticoagulation regimen. And because they are non-randomized and non-blinded, there is always a scope for bias. The problem is that we have only one study which has been con completed as far as randomized controlled trials are concerned. The basic problem with RCTs in this subset of patients is patient recruitment. More and more physicians and patients are convinced about the utility of closing PFOs. I don't know based on what. 
And therefore, PFOs continue to get closed on compassionate grounds, what we call as off-label use of devices. Now let's look at the non-randomized data. Meta-analysis presented in 2003 reduced the recurrence rate from 4 to 12 percent down to 0 to 4 percent. Wendecker and Bernie Meyer presented their data in 2004 showed that recurrence rate dropped by nearly 66 percent from 24 to 8.5. And another study which appeared in 2005 in International Journal of Cardiology showed that the annual recurrence rate was least with device, 0.6 percent, as compared to warfarin, which was 5.6, as compared to aspirin, which was 13 percent. A systematic review of case series was published in Lancet. Eight series comprising of nearly 1,000 patients treated medically and 12 studies comprising of 2,000 patients with device closure. And they looked at the annual rate of CVA and TIAs. It was significantly lower in device group, 1.3% as against 5.2%, so a reduction of nearly 65%. Now let's look at Closure 1 trial, the only randomized control trial that we have. It's a multi-center randomized trial. The device used was Starflex versus medical therapy. The people who were included, the age range from 18 to 60 years, had a TIA or stroke and had a PFO with right to left shunt. The primary endpoint was a composite endpoint comprising of stroke TIA occurring during two years of follow-up death from any cause in first 30 days, and death from a neurological cause from one month to two years. 909 patients were enrolled, and if you look at the cumulative incidence of primary endpoints, it was 5.5% in device group versus 6.8% in medical group, showing no statistically significant difference. There were no deaths in first 30 days and no neurological deaths between one month and two years. So composite endpoints ultimately boiled down to recurrence of TIAs and strokes within first two years. So what did they conclude? In patients with cryptogenic stroke or TIA who had a patent forum and OL, closure with a device did not offer a greater benefit than medical therapy alone for the prevention of recurrent stroke or TIA. You will ask me, is this the gospel truth? And the answer is certainly no. There are a lot of limitations of closure. First and foremost is they started excluding some of the patients with large atrial septal aneurysms. And as you know, this is the highest risk group as far as the cryptogenic strokes are concerned. So probably you dealt with patients who are at a lower risk of recurrence. The second thing is there is a possibility that because of the conviction of the physicians, those who are at high risk, Went, to, went ahead with closure of their uh, PFOs outside the trial. They were not a part of the trial. The success rate and complication rate in the device arm, if you look at this uh, data, is significantly higher than what has been reported in literature. They started with a very ambitious program of looking at 50% risk reduction, and they had to, for that, recruit 1,600 patients. At the end of four years, they realized that they could barely recruit 700. So promptly, they started increasing the risk reduction rate to 66%, and that is how a figure of 800 came through. As you know, Starflex is not one of the best devices, and as of now, it is withdrawn for the market because the rates of residual shunts are pretty high. And if you look at uh, the data from Frankfurt, it is a single most thrombogenic devices available for closure of PFO or ASDs. The second important thing is look at the risk factor profile. 30% are hypertension, 20% smoked, diabetes mellitus incidence not stated. So we don't even know whether they were truly cryptogenic strokes. And on neuroimaging, if there was lacunar stroke, they were not excluded. So whether we were really dealing with patients of paradoxical embolism at all. The incidence of atrial fibrillation appears to be significantly higher, 5.7% versus 0.7% in, uh, in the control group. Now, I do not know whether a presence of device caused any significant increase in the rate of atrial fibrillation. And more importantly, they had to withdraw warfarin from the device group as against a medical group where they could continue with warfarin, which could have secondarily affected the final outcome. So the results of closure, although they give us some guidelines, are not the ultimate truth. There are three or four more randomized trials in progress. 
They are the close trial, the PC and the RISPEC trial, which is from St. Jude's device, which is outside US, and RISPEC is inside US. And then you have reduced trial, wherein Helix device from Gore is being used against medical treatment. However, the results will come up only after 1940, uh, 2014. Complications. Certainly, complications are a part of any device closure. And the summary of 11 studies showed that the incidence of TIAs was 0.2%, tamponade 0.3%, finite incidence of device embolization, and some complications at the puncture site. However, no major complications in the form of deaths, AMIs, strokes, or any other event which will have long-term implications. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are certainly difficulties in decision making because we have only one randomized trial with a number of limitations. The off-label use is so rampant that recruiting patients in trials has become very, very difficult. And as you know, research is always a work in progress. It's not like static. So you will have anticoagulation management strategies which will change, and so will there be a change in device technology. So these are moving targets. So what has been our practice? We are certainly not closing PFOs for primary prevention. However, we strongly consider closing PFOs if there is a cryptogenic stroke in patients less than 40 years, where embolic etiology has been proven and there is a positive neuroimaging in, the to uh, in terms of infarction. There are no other cardiac and vascular sources of embolism. The right to left shunt either at rest or provoked with valsalva is at least moderate or large, more so if there is presence of uh, atrial septal aneurysm and we are extremely bullish if there is a recurrence of event on antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy. So ladies and gentlemen, I would say the conclusion is very simple. Do not chase every hole, be selective. So as I said in the beginning, probably the truth lies somewhere in between. Thank you for your patient hearing, ladies and gentlemen.